Well, it's good to see you on this uh, first Sunday of the year. I hope you had a good uh, Christmas and a great start uh, to the to the new year. And uh, it's good to be in 2024. I do feel like this past week has been a bit um, uh, draggy. Have you have you felt that? Yeah. Anybody else felt that? It's just kind of like having a hard time kind of getting going into 2024. And I've been talking to some other people saying, yeah, like I just haven't found the gear yet. And uh, I get that. And that's probably more true for you guys than the guys at 9 o'clock because at least they got up and got to church by 9. So... <laughs> I mean, I'm just expecting that y'all are really tired and dragging yourself here today, so, um, but I'm expecting big things as I preach that you're going to be with me every step of the way, amen? amen? Yeah, good, perfect. That's what I was hoping to hear, so, um, <clears throat> but uh, today's message is going to be a little bit different, so I am going to preach a message in Acts 13. It's going to be a little, a little shorter than normal. I was just pausing for an amen there, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't get to... Again, you're just proving that you're not quite with me yet, so that's fine. A little shorter than normal, but have no fear. I'll be back to the normal time soon. Um, but uh, then I'm going to take some time, because it is the first Sunday of the year, to talk about some vision stuff and some things that are important for us to know that the staff team would really want you to know going into this new year. So we're going to do that. I'm going to preach, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get right into that. And uh, so that's going to be our morning together. Sound good? All right. Well, uh, let's put your attention on the screen for a second. Are you old enough to remember uh, TVs like this? Um, that's, uh, or how about a TV like this one? Uh, get the second one there. Yeah, there. So you had the, like the box TV on the stand, and then you had the big console TV. How many people remember these TVs? Yes, yes, those are pictures of me. That was my cowboy phase there on the right. I don't know. Um, but, but those. I think that first TV on the left there, I think that's an old black and white. We had that one when we lived uh, in Montreal North. And then on the West Island, I think we had this big old console TV. It, it might have been, been color uh, TV, but I'm not sure. Um, but uh, those were our TVs in the late 60s, early 70s. And, um, and, you know, you had black and white. You had eight to ten channels. I grew up in Montreal, so, you know, half of them were French, so that was pretty useless to me. Um, but, um, but not to Patrice. I get it. You, you needed those channels. But, um, you know, squarer. You didn't quite get the full vision that we have today uh, of all of that. And certainly uh, nothing as awesome as, as 4K, Nothing as awesome as ultra high definition. Admit it when you go to Costco. You love to wander down those aisles and just look at that high definition beauty. And I often pray in those aisles. <laughs> I, I often pray very selfish prayers there. Um, but high definition resolution is it's it's stunning. It's when you see it, it's stunning. And you see things you didn't see before, and it's gripping, it holds uh, your gaze. And I want you to park that thought for a second, because we're going to talk uh, about that. But in today's passage, Paul preaches a sermon at a synagogue in a city that had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ before. And he and Barnabas were on their first missionary journey. They had been sent out by the church in Antioch and Syria and into Asia Minor and uh, modern-day Turkey. And their strategy was to go to a given city and to go to the local synagogue. And, and even though they were in Gentile context, they were still going to Jewish places, to a synagogue, because the Jews, at the very least, had a frame of reference for what Paul and Barnabas would be preaching, the gospel. They had the Hebrew Scriptures, they had the Old Testament pro promises, and they had the prophecies that pointed forward uh, to the Messiah. And so Paul centered everything he said. When he got into these synagogues and he preached uh, the message, he centered everything on the person of Jesus Christ. And you could think of it this way. It was high, ultra high definition resolution of Jesus Christ that he pre presented for them. And, and, and what you see every time in Paul's teaching is, is perfect clarity of the Christ, of the Messiah. And I have to believe that you get a bunch of people, this, this number of people together, and, and those that are watching on the live stream right now, that I have to believe as we start out in a new ministry or a new calendar year, and it, it's no big deal, really. Um, I mean, you, you know, on, on July or on January 1st, you just move from one day to another. It's just one week to another. It's just one month to another. It's one year to another. But we make kind of a big deal of the whole thing. 
And it is a time for us to reflect and to think about the kind of year that we want to live this coming year. Maybe some changes that we think ought to be made in our lives in, in light of the turn of, of the calendar. And so I have to believe as we, as we sit here on, on this day that more than a few of us are looking for clarity. That more than a few of us are looking for answers to very hard questions that we're looking for relief from something we're going through, or, or we're looking for a direction on a certain decision that has to be made. Some of us are even looking for hope this year because we believe that the year behind us didn't provide much of that. And in verse 38, we see Paul say, speak of this man, speaking of Jesus, he says, this man, Jesus. And what he presents to us is all of these things, all the things we could possibly look for in 2024. He's all of that and more. And when we see Jesus in 4K clarity, in ultra high definition, we see what we must believe about him. And we also see how that changes and impacts our lives. And so I'm going to read Acts 13, 26 through to 41. You can um, follow along in your Bible as I do. And then we'll work quickly through these verses. Acts 13, 26. Now remember, this is partway through a sermon. I'll say something about that in a moment. So it's partway through a sermon and he is speaking about Jesus here. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second Psalm. You are my son, today I've begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. All right, let's talk about this man, Jesus. This man, uh, Jesus, was human like us and yet knowable as God. Now, again, I said this passage is part of a sermon that Paul was preaching in another town called Antioch. This was Antioch, Pisidia in uh, modern-day Turkey. And in the first part of the sermon, which you could read in verses 16 through 25, and we covered that in our last message in Acts, he had walked them through in that first part, he had walked them through Jewish history to see how God, all the way along, God had been pointing to the Messiah in the prophecies, in the stories, in, even in the rituals, in the Levitical law, the Mosaic law, it had all pointed to Jesus, to, to the Messiah all the way along. And he finally says in verse 23, he reveals it, he says, God has brought to Israel a savior. All this history was pointing to this moment. And he says, his name is Jesus. As he promised, he identifies the fact that it's always been pointing at Jesus. 
which is the point he makes in our passage here in verse 26. Through Abraham, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. He's referring to Jesus. And he acknowledges, um, and, he, and, he, and, he, and this, well, first of all, this is big news. This is big news to this synagogue. Because they've never heard anything like this. They've heard the prophecies. They know the scriptures. They know the promises of God. But they didn't know that he had arrived. They didn't know that his name was Jesus. And so this is shocking news to them. Because Paul names him, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And he acknowledges, as we do today, that this message for them is going to be a tough one to accept because the religious leaders in Israel who saw Jesus, saw the miracles, heard the teaching, they had a hard time with it. Notice verse 27, the people in Jerusalem, their rulers, did not recognize him nor understand what the prophets had said. They had the scriptures... They knew the scriptures well. They saw Jesus and all that he said and all that he had done, and they couldn't accept him as their Messiah. And the terrible irony of this is that these prophecies had been read to them Sabbath after Sabbath, year after year in their synagogues. And they end up unintentionally fulfilling the prophecies by condemning him. The Jews themselves, rather than recognizing their Messiah, actually condemn him and have him executed. And among the things that they simply could not grasp about him was his humanity. They knew him. They knew him as a man. And the astounding implication of all of this is that God had visited them. God had visited them As a human being, he had made himself knowable in a way that had long ago been lost to humanity. You know, we've just come through the Christmas season and we've celebrated and looked at the nativity again. And in the nativity, we celebrate the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the incarnation of God, God becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us. The incarnation is is what makes God so accessible to us in a way that no other religion offers. And Christianity is unique in this. God made flesh, identifying with us and inviting us into this relationship where we can truly know our God in a personal, intimate, and experiential way. And in his humanity, see this next, he was innocent of all sin. And yet he was condemned. Verse 28, and and though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. Now Pilate is the, he's the Roman governor. The Jews themselves have no authority to pronounce a death sentence on anyone or to carry that out. And so they appeal to the Roman governor to do this on their behalf. And Pilate does it even though he doesn't want to. His wife doesn't want him to. He doesn't believe that this man is guilty and worthy of this execution, but he does it for political reasons. He does it to appease the Jewish leadership, all the while maintaining that Jesus was innocent. In fact, we know the stories, everything that tells us about Jesus' sinlessness. We know that uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, Ga- uh, Gospel of Luke, in chapter 4 of both Gospels, he goes through the temptation and he meets with Satan at, at a very vulnerable moment. He meets with Satan and Satan tempts him three times and all three times Jesus resists. Peter commenting on Jesus' life and writing his letter said in 1 Peter 1.19, that, that, that salvation is affected in our lives. It happens in our lives as a result of the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He is the perfect sacrificial lamb. The preacher said in Hebrews 4.15 that Jesus was in every respect tempted as we are and yet without sin. Despite his perfection, Jesus was condemned to die. And this man, Jesus, was crucified, yet resurrected from the dead. 
And again, there's irony here in verse 29. When they had, when they had carried out all that was written of him, unintentionally fulfilling the prophecies. That is to say, they killed him. They saw to his execution. They took him down from the tree. They took him down from the cross. And they laid him in a tomb. Now, what's interesting about verse 29, as you think about the people in your life, or maybe even some people that are here, some people that are listening right now, that, that sometimes we have people in our lives that dispute these things. What's curious about verse 29 is that no one of any repute, no scholar of history or of religion disputes the facts of verse 29. Even ardent atheistic scholars accept this particular body of facts, that Jesus was a real human, that he lived in that part of the world at that particular time, that he grew up to be a teacher who toured around the area and taught these things that he was condemned to die and that he was crucified. Even non-believing atheistic scholars will affirm that body of facts. Now, this is true, by the way, with, with variations on details, these facts are also true for the founders of other religions. They also lived, they also taught, they also died, and they were also buried. And the audacious claim of the gospel of Jesus Christ is verse 30. But God raised Jesus from the dead. And that is the key point. That is the hinge point up upon which everything else that we believe hangs. Verse 31, and many, many became his witnesses to the people. And the result is that a long ago promise was powerfully fulfilled. Paul points his Jewish and devout Gentile hearers to the Old Testament that they had heard every Sabbath day to make his point. In the same way, I'm preaching a sermon, but I am preaching the text of God's word. And so you are hearing me refer to the actual verses that I'm preaching. In the same way, Paul was presenting the gospel in this synagogue, and he's preaching his sermon, but he's basing it on the scriptures. He's pointing to the Old Testament scriptures, which they were very familiar with. And so he's pointing them to the word. And he says in verse 32, we're bringing you the good news, we're bringing you the gospel, that what God promised to the fathers, what was in the word about all of this, verse 33, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. And he cites three passages. The first one, he says in a psalm, and this refers to Psalm 2, verse 7, he says, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And um, a reference to King David, a reference to the Messiah, the line of King David. And he says this to indicate the divine human nature that Jesus would have. Then in verse 34, to show that he had actually raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he cites Isaiah 55, verse 3. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David, fulfilling the, the, the promise that God had made to David, his throne would be eternal, that he would not see death and his body would not be corrupted or decay or decompose in the ground. Well, that obviously did happen to David, so that needed to be fulfilled by someone else who was in David's line. And Paul's making the point that that was Jesus. And finally, verse 35 Paul says, he, 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 he says also in another psalm, and this is Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not let your Holy One see corruption, reinforcing that point again that he is going to be raised never to die. His body will not be in the grave. Unlike King David's, it will not decompose, it will not decay. Verse 36, yes, David fell asleep and was laid with his father and saw corruption. His body decomposed. Verse 37, but he whom God raised did not see corruption corruption, did not remain in the grave, and did not decompose. This is what we need to see about Jesus every time. This is the ultra high definition image that we need to get of Jesus, 
This is the 4K resolution that we must have in front of us as we seek to be the followers of Christ and to be the church of Jesus Christ. And when we have that crystal clear image in front of us, that creates some implications for you and for me. If this is Jesus, then I need to ask the question, if this is who he is, then how's that going to affect my life? And what changes do I need to make? And that's going to inform how I look at 2024. And so we see this man, Jesus, that he was all of these things. And through this man, I'm offered three amazing benefits that I can't produce myself. A lot of us go into the new year, we make our resolutions, and then we, we muster the willpower. I'm not so silly as to not understand that resolutions that you made on January 1st, you have already broken. I'm aware of that. Or you're delaying the start till February 1st. I, I get it, because we're seeking to go about it just by the sheer force of our own will. And that may help you with a few things, but it's not going to help you with these things. And these are far more important. Three amazing benefits that I cannot produce myself. The first one is this, the forgiveness of my sin. You do not need to forgive yourself. That's psychological mumbo jumbo. You need Jesus to forgive you. The forgiveness of my sin. And, and when, you, when you think about it, this is your greatest need. When you think about all the needs that you, you might have going into this new year, this, in fact, is your greatest need. You may think, you know what, I don't know how the budget's going to work out this year, and I don't know about the economy, and, and I think I just need more income. Or you think like I'm facing some, some health scare or, or there's some relational issue that's going on in your marriage and your family, some estrangement with a, with, a, with a child or something going on at work. Whatever it happens to be, you think that's your greatest need going into the year. And I'm telling you, it's not. It's your relationship with Christ. All those other circumstances are going to be there in one form or another. If you solve one, another one's going to be right there. Happy New Year. So whatever you think your greatest need is, at this moment, it's, it's actually the forgiveness of your sin. If you've not yet, especially, listen, if you've not yet become a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are not yet a Christian, not by the cultural definition of what a Christian is, but not yet a Christian by the biblical definition of what that is, then the forgiveness of your sins is your greatest need. And so Paul and Barnabas went into this synagogue not knowing the people of this city. They don't know the people. They haven't been in this city before to preach this gospel. They don't know who these people are. They show up at the synagogue. They're strangers. They don't know what their particular needs are, the specific things that are going on in their families and marriages. They don't know any of that. And yet they know exactly what they need to preach. It's Jesus. Verse 38, let it be known to you, therefore, in light of everything we just told you about Jesus, here's the implications, that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. We get so sidetracked with, you know, we want to we invite people to come and, 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 and be part of this, to, to follow Jesus with us, and, and very often the thing we're focused on is their bad, mar bad marriage or their addiction or or this struggle that they're going through, and we focus on that thing, and we think in our own minds that really what we're doing is we're, we're doing some kind of renovation project with people and trying to get them to live more moral lives or to sort out some difficulty that's in their life, and Jesus can come and just fix that problem for you, and that's not the thing. That's not the gospel. We, we need to stop. In fact, we need to stop giving so much attention to, to these cultural moments that we find ourselves in. And, and we, we're preaching to every wind of change that blows through history. You know, whatever's happening out there, you know me, I love history, and so do like 12 to 15 of you I know. <laughs> like, we'll love history, but whatever's happening out 
there in this moment of history. It's happened before. It's going to happen again. Because history is cyclical. And whatever thing's happening right now, it's going to stop. And then it's, it's, and you know, if we could only learn from history. But the problem is only 12 or 15 of you are reading it. And so that is why. This is, that's why we repeat it. But we repeat all of this. So why become so fixated on the cultural or historic moment that we find ourselves in? Let's be fixated on Jesus. The message never changes. It survives all of that. You need to be forgiven of your sin. That's what we need to tell people. You're separated from God because of your sin. You're going to spend eternity without him. You need to be forgiven of your sin. Whatever else is going on in your life, that's your pressing, that's your pressing issue. In times of war and peace throughout history, people needed to be forgiven of their sins. Under dictators and democracies, people need to be forgiven of their sins. In poverty and prosperity, people need to be forgiven of their sins. Whether blessed or oppressed, people need to be forgiven of their sins. And only Jesus can do that. That's what he offers. And the second offer, of course, is related to it. It's, it's an offer of freedom from working for my salvation. It's, it's the freedom from having to work toward the forgiveness of my own sins. The downside of every other religion in the world is the fact that you must do something to get the benefit. Religion is works-based. At some level, you earn what you are supposed to get. And there's some obvious examples of that. So I could talk about Islam. I could talk about Hinduism. I could talk about Buddhism. All of them have elements of you have to work for it. You have to do these rites, rituals, say these prayers in order to get the benefit. But many forms of Christianity proclaim the same thing. Most obviously because we're Protestants. We don't mind having the Catholics as whipping boys for uh, a little while. We've been doing it for 500 years since the Reformation, right? And so you could talk about Catholicism, and it's pretty obvious, and it's not hard to find content from official church dogma that teaches that it's, it's, it's faith plus work. So you have to do both of these things in order to be accepted as a good Catholic. But let's talk about us. Let's talk about Protestantism, because there are plenty of examples within Protestantism, even within evangelical, the evangelical branch of it, where we arrive at the same distorted gospel, ineffective, works-based salvation, where we have mandatory rights and legalistic forms that are added to the gospel. And that's not what Paul is preaching here. But rather that, look at verse 39, rather that by Jesus, everyone who believes. Three words. Everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. And he's talking to Jews, so he focuses on their particular brand of legalistic gospel plus religion, which was Judaism, which was the Mosaic law, that I have to, I have to fulfill these Levitical uh, practices and this Mosaic law in order to be a good Jew. If he was talking to Hindus or Muslims, it would have, it would have sounded different. He would have said something different, but he's talking to Jews. And he's saying, you have to be freed from all of this, freed from your sins, because the law of Moses was never going to get you there. He's telling his audience and he's telling us that law keeping and religion and rights do not get it done. They don't absolve us of our sin. The only requirement for that is belief. Not moral excellence, not good works, not generosity, not religious observance, not upbringing or bloodlines. Faith alone. 
Romans 10, 13. Paul would write this to the Romans uh, later. He, he would say, for everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's ultra high definition, 4K clarity of the gospel. Now for sure, what comes after that the means by which we get the forgiveness of sins, that's it, it's belief. But following belief, once we exercise faith, once we become believers, then what flows from that is holiness and righteousness and, 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 and good works, all of that flows out of my life as a result of my sins being forgiven. After the fact, as evidence that it is genuine and providing me as a believer with, with an assurance of the gift of my salvation. So don't try to earn this. Because God means to simply give it to you as a gift. Don't attempt to clean up your life first. I, I have to clean some things up before I go to church, before I receive the gospel, before I become a Christian. No, you don't, and it won't help. Don't think that your charitableness or strong moral stand or family background will save you. They won't. Here's the final offer that he makes to you and me. Faith to overcome my unbelief. He offers us faith. Paul issues this warning in his sermon before he closes off, and he says in verse 40, notice, beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. And he's, he's saying, listen to the word, and he's quoting from one of the minor prophets, Habakkuk. This is Habakkuk 1.5, where the prophet wrote, uh, and he cites it in verse 41 here. He says, look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. You who mock the gospel, you don't receive it. You mock the gospel. You think it's ridiculous. And yet you're surprised by it, but you're going to die by it. He's addressing all the people who hear this life-giving message of Jesus and not only reject it, but ridicule it. And you know people like that, don't you? You know people who ridicule the gospel? I have people like that in my life. You know, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, I have a presence on social media, and I have people who follow me who are uh, my own loved ones, family members, extended family members who see the things that I post on social media and will, in their own way, not usually on the posts I put up, not usually, but in their own post will put up things that are obvious responses to what I've put up, ridiculing what I believe about the gospel. And lots of us have people in our lives like that. And some of you, in fact, who are here and listening to me right now, you were the ones who ridiculed the gospel before you received it. The warning here is leveled because God says, to them, I'm doing a work in your days. Like I'm moving, the Holy Spirit is moving and people are getting saved and lives are being transformed and I am shaping history according to my will. He says, it's a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. And this is this isn't like, oh, you won't believe this. You know that thing we say to people when we see something incredible, we want them to see it? Well, you won't believe this. It's not that kind of you won't believe it. It's, it's a statement of fact. It's, it's going to be proclaimed, and you're going to know it, and you're going to understand it. You're going to know exactly what it's saying. And you will not believe it. You won't. It's a prophetic word over them. Even though they heard it, understand it, they'll reject it and in fact mock it as being ridiculous. And this describes, by the way, the entire generation of people that we live among today in this culture. And I, and I would say especially those who are in positions of power and authority and it's becoming increasingly difficult for Christians who hold deep convictions about the gospel to find their place in the public service because of this because the gospel is increasingly being mocked in the town square and in the places of power. 
In our Western world, it, it, it's fashionable to categorically reject and even be hostile toward the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the implications of having the gospel at the center, we preach the forgiveness of sins and belief in Jesus Christ, but of course, the implications are we believe some other things. There are things we believe about gender and things we believe about sexuality and things that we believe about the Creator and this world. There are things that we believe about the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, that there is only one way to God. And all of these things make us less than fashionable in the world around us. And there is a, a built-in official hostility toward this gospel that we preach. And what God has done for the one who repents, because it's so difficult to believe, what God has done for the one who repents is offer them the gift of faith, that even faith itself is a gift. And that's what helps us overcome this raging unbelief that we have. Paul would say this to the Ephesians. This is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. I never tire of hearing those verses and I feel like they may be the most quoted two verses that I use. But it points to this beautiful gift of faith that God has given to us. We're not getting it any other way. So that's the offer, the multiple offers that God makes to us. And it comes to us with 4K clarity. And knowing what you know about this man, Jesus, what has been proclaimed here again today, knowing your own great need, will you take him up on the offer? Will you come to him in faith alone for the forgiveness of your sins? That's the appeal to anyone who does not yet know Christ. And for the Christian, at the outset of this new year, will you bring the gospel back to the center of your life with all the implications that that comes with? So I'm going to pray right now, and then uh, we're going to go into our vision talk. So bow your heads with me in prayer as we think about these things. <clears throat> Father, um, I'm grateful again that you have not only proclaimed your word to us and, and, and given us the, the clarity that we need about Jesus Christ, but Father, you've spoken into our deep, deep need. And Father, I speak first um, uh, to you about those who have not yet committed their life to Christ. And I, I pray that all who would hear this message would would consider this, that your Holy Spirit would be working in their lives and give them this gift of faith so that they could overcome their unbelief and have the forgiveness of sins. Father, help us all to see that all of our striving and working after these things is not accomplishing anything and to trust fully in you for our salvation. And Father, I pray for those of us who are believers, who have walked with you, some for a short period of time and, and others for decades. I pray, God, that we would reaffirm at the start of this year, uh, Father, that the gospel is at the center of our lives and that, God, we would be willing to receive and to live out all of the implications and applications of that. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.